long, multi-tiered racks. It seems they'll never end. Down the shelves, your daily route is tens of kilometers long. Tens of kilometers of mushrooms. Mushrooms for breakfast, mushrooms for lunch, mushrooms for dinner, occasionally, if there are any left. But you know that complaining is meaningless. You need to work and feed a group of warriors. Otherwise, next time you won't be able to fight off the exhausted people, mad with hunger, attacking your farm. But if you're lucky, you're alive only thanks to the farm of mushrooms that can grow without sunlight. At the beginning of the eternal twilight, many people believed that canned food in the still undisturbed markets would last for a long time, and then everything would go back as it always was. A warm office, a comfortable chair, a medium fried steak and a beer on Friday. A lot has changed since then. First, ammunition ran out. Then, the supply of diesel fuel for the generator came to an end. Darkness was coming closer, along with hungry, emaciated cannibals who had recently been office clerks, sales managers, and YouTubers. Therefore, your family spends all day watering dozens of kilometers of mushroom racks and forgot that there were once offices and chairs. However, the meaning of the word steak was revealed to the younger brother when a mole got caught in one of the traps. Now, I'm going to share with you how this dark scenario could happen in our world. This is Chicxulub, an ancient impact crater. Its size is amazing, a diameter of 180 kilometers and an original depth of up to 20 kilometers. It was formed almost 67 million years ago when an asteroid with a diameter of more than 10 kilometers crashed into what is known to us as the Yucatan Peninsula at great speed. It was this event that strangely coincided with the end of the age of dinosaurs. No, the asteroid didn't kill the dinosaurs with its direct hit. Only a few of them drowned in a giant tsunami up to 100 meters high which resulted from the impact of the asteroid and rolled deep into the continents, destroying all life. But the seismic impact triggered the eruption of volcanoes in many parts of the world. And pieces of hot rock thrown out by the asteroid impact to a height of more than 100 kilometers caused massive forest fires within a radius of more than 1,000 kilometers from the epicenter of the event. 15 trillion tons of ash, dust, and soot were lifted to the very top of the atmosphere, which is the mass of almost 4 million Great Pyramid of Giza's. They absorbed sunlight in a dense layer, which led to changes in the climate of our planet. The multi-year winter arrived. During the day, the Earth was as dark as a moonlit night. As a result of the lack of light for plants, photosynthesis slowed down, and many species of flora are now known to us only from scientific studies of archaeological deposits from that era. The temperature on the continents dropped by 28 degrees Celsius, the sun no longer evaporated water, and the rains stopped for many years. The soil dried up and cracked. In such conditions, entire species and families of plants were put on the brink of extinction. Only those who managed to somehow adapt and survive until the end of the volcanic winter survived. A critical decrease in the volume of green mass and phytoplankton led to the extinction of first herbivores and soon after them predators whose food supply disappeared. But the greatest mass extinction occurred when 96% of all marine species and 73% of terrestrial vertebrate species disappeared from the planet. This happened about 250 million years ago and is known as the Permian-Triassic extinction event. Even 83% of the insect species that are known for their ability to adapt to any cataclysms died out. Is it worth depicting this tragedy when scientists have already discovered a huge impact crater on Wilkes Land under the ice sheet of Antarctica with a diameter of 500 kilometers? 
the impact of this asteroid in time miraculously coincides with the Permian-Triassic extinction event. However, we can reassure ourselves, asteroids with a diameter of 10 kilometers or more don't terrorize our planet more often than once every 100 million years. So for now, we can sleep peacefully, and by the next time it happens, people will have probably come up with something. But such an asteroid isn't the only possible cause of such a cataclysm. Everything could be much closer and simpler. This is Laki, a volcano in Iceland. In 1783, its eruption lasted eight months and threw 15 cubic kilometers of hot lava on the ground and in the upper atmosphere, ash, soot, and clouds of toxic compounds of sulfur dioxide and fluorine covered the sky over most of Eurasia. In the first year, more than half of Iceland's livestock died, followed by starvation and the death of 20% of the country's population. Too long ago, are those days long gone? Well, let's ask the experts what could happen today. This is Yellowstone National Park in the United States. Beneath it lies a huge fault measuring 50 by 75 kilometers filled with red-hot magma. If this volcano erupts, it will spew out hundreds of cubic kilometers of molten material, incinerating everything for 100 kilometers and covering Wyoming and the surrounding states with 5 meters of volcanic ash. However, this destruction will not end. According to NASA employee Dr. Brian Wilcox, the dust and gases released during the eruption will block the sun from us and plunge the world into a volcanic winter that will last for decades and kill 99% of all life on Earth. But the Yellowstone volcano is just one of 20 so-called supervolcanoes scattered around the world, all of them like a time bomb or powder keg in a basement. NASA claims that the eruption of even one of them would put an end to humanity much faster than an asteroid. I would like to hope that such scenarios will remain as horror stories, that we'll be lucky, and that our planet won't deal us many years of solid winter and night. But there's always a chance that humanity will bring about such an apocalypse on its own. Have you ever heard of the nuclear winter? This is the global state of the Earth's climate as a result of a large-scale nuclear war. As a result of the release of huge amounts of smoke and soot into the stratosphere caused by extensive fires during the explosion of several hundred nuclear warheads, the temperature on the planet could drop to Arctic levels everywhere. A hypothetical exchange of nuclear strikes between Russia and the United States would reduce the average temperature on Earth to below the values of the coldest ice age and virtually destroy all agriculture on our planet, creating critical conditions for the survival of the remnants of human civilization. By the way, it's almost impossible to prepare for this type of apocalypse. No matter how well you stock up, you'll run out of ammo anyway, and canned food even faster. The ability to produce fire by friction or collect moisture from cacti in the desert, this all means nothing when the energy of the sun doesn't reach the surface of the planet and the earth refuses to produce food for billions of people. There might not be enough food for even a thousand people. In many developed countries, food supplies are sufficient for several months for everyone. Perhaps this is enough to survive the cataclysm with minimal losses. But if the night and winter last for years or decades, only a few will survive. With so much time without resources, the only ones who could wait it out would be tight-knit communities of technocrats who would be able to continue exploiting the benefits of civilization in the form of hydro or wind power plants for a while and, due to this, organize food production for their community. Only a select few would get that far. Survival would be possible only on the principle of few people, lots of energy. 
For some time, there would be separate groups of fighters for their lives. They would be able to survive, grow mushrooms, catch algae, collect worms, set traps for the last animals that somehow, in turn, hadn't died out. But it wouldn't last. Those who remained outside these organized communities would be left to die powerlessly, to starve, to die at the cannibal stake, to die on the hunter's spear for the cannibals. Is there any difference? I've always wondered how the primate species Homo sapiens became the dominant species on the planet as a result of anthropogenesis. Scientists have studied ancient people who, for many generations, fed on sparse vegetation and survived, or people whose tribes lived near the migration routes of ungulates and ate only horse meat and left numerous offspring, and those who lived in the equatorial desert and those who lived in the Arctic tundra. Someone ancient crossed the Bering Strait and entered North America. Someone crossed the ocean on a fragile boat and sailed south. Without claws and fangs, the human was stronger than the cave lion. Being hundreds of times smaller than a mammoth, the human finished the last one off 10,000 years ago. And even if, in the event of the cataclysm we've described today, only one thousandth of a percent of the current population of Homo sapiens lives to see the hot sun in a clear sky, this is more than enough for the human civilization to survive and recover. The human is the most resilient, most intelligent, and most developed creature on the planet. And if at least some species on Earth survive, be sure we will be among them.